This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. We just talked about how private I am <laughs> in my life, and you're broadcasting my favorite three cheese choices. Will they 3D print the baby and mail it to me? Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we weigh the pros and cons of finishing your PhD remotely. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 95. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. 95, Dan, we are marching toward episode 100. Are we going to do something special on that exciting episode? You know, I have had this thought that it would be really cool to go back through our first 100 episodes and, and just do a montage of all of our favorite moments but then it occurred to me how much work that would be That'd for be me. a lot of work, <laughs> yeah. As, as the person who edits the podcast, Josh, good luck. Uh, but how about this? I will say this, and maybe no one will take me up on this. If you have a particular episode or moment on the show that resonated with you or that you remember well, email us, podcast at hellophd.com, or send us a tweet or Facebook message and let us know what it is, and maybe we'll include that on episode 100 and even better if you have a timestamp for when it was <laughs> in the episode that would be great that's asking quite a that's bit but, yeah, why not? but at the very least uh, if you've got a, a particular moment give us the episode number and what the moment was and we will we'll pull some of this together if we can awesome dan you will notice we have a little change of pace in the studio today i see before me a very large wine glass with a beautiful red wine sitting inside. I assume it's red wine. It is, Dan. Today we are drinking the Albertina Cabernet Sauvignon Grand Reserve 2014 vintage from Zmarsley Family Vineyards in Mendocino, California. Okay, so we're going a little higher scale here, Josh. Um, my bow tie is in the car. Should I go get it? <laughs> uh, it's a little too warm for a tie today. Okay. Dan, it will become apparent very soon why uh, breaking tradition and breaking out the wine glasses instead of the, the pint glasses today. Tell me what I'm about to taste, Josh. Tell me the flavors I should be looking for. It may come as a surprise to some of our listeners, but I am probably as much of a wine fan as you. And in fact, we have probably shared just as many glasses of wine as we have pints of beer. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty accurate. And actually, I believe if you go to our website on the About tab, there's a photo of you and I there. That is so true. The only photo of us together in existence. <laughs> Might be. But that is from a, a wine tasting. It's from a wine fair. One of our, one of our hangouts uh, as grad students, there is a local wine tasting that happens, I think, twice a year now. And uh, it's very inexpensive to get in. You get to sample all these different wines, and then we would kind of hang out around the picnic table. So Yeah, I think in grad school, it was, it was $5. It was an event for us. Five dollars to try forty wines, and you get to keep the glass. Tiny, tiny little tasting <laughs> glass, yeah. Which I have a cabinet full of, of course. <laughs> I, know, I yeah. do too. Uh, actually, a funny story about our drinking of wine versus beer. I was traveling to a different university earlier this year, and as part of that, we were taken out to to dinner to a nice restaurant one night. And one of the organizers, one of the faculty members, said to me as we were sitting down at dinner, she said, and she's someone who's listened to the podcast before. She said, oh, Josh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not sure if this restaurant serves beer. As if you were going <laughs> to walk out. As if that's the only thing <laughs> that I drink. I said, well, you know, yeah. I, I, I could drink a glass of wine and be equally happy. It's fine. All right. Well, do you want me to describe the wine or do you want yeah, to Yeah, tell it? me what you taste. Um, you're going to be mad at me, though. My, my first, the nose on this is ethanol, which is the name of this section of the show, but... I do get hmm. the kind of aroma yeah. of, of alcohol. Um, it's dry, but not overly dry. It's not super tannic. And I'd like to know which flavors you're getting out of it. Yes, I will agree that the nose on this one is pretty mild. There's not a lot of, you know, 
certain wines, you get a lot of aromas before you even taste it, which may be totally different than the taste itself. And I agree with you, Dan. I'm not getting a lot on the nose of this one. Yeah, I agree. This one is a little dry, not too dry for me. I think I'm getting a little bit of leather, maybe a little bit of tobacco with this one. What do you think? Could be the cigar you're smoking right now. <laughs> and the piece of leather you're chewing on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's got a little bit of fruit, but not, not overly jammy. You are keeping me kind of in suspense about why we got wine this week. Not that I'm not thankful. Well, hold that thought and when we get to the science in the news section. Okay. How about that? I will try to do that. Dan, beyond being thankful for this wine, I'm thankful that we have two new patrons this week. Fantastic. Tell us who they are. Yeah, I wanted to say a special thanks to William and Risa, who became patrons of Hello PhD. So special thanks to them. And hopefully we'll be seeing them online in our uh, patron-only Slack channel. Yeah, that's right. If you'd like to, to become a patron of the show, you can just go to patreon.com slash HelloPhD or click the Become a Patron button on our website. And Josh, let's not forget to thank Promega, who is a sponsor for this episode and provides a technical support team available on their website. They're there to help you interpret your results, to help you understand which reagents you need to be using at each step, understanding the protocols you're using. Again, if you're actively doing experiments, it's not worth waiting weeks or months failing uh, through those experiments when there is support available. You just go to promega.com slash PhD support, and they're there to help. Dan, so we had a lot of great response from our last episode on grades and whether they matter. And I think we actually got a follow-up from Zachary, who was the original grad student who asked the question. Yeah, we reached back out to Zachary because it had been quite a while since he had emailed his question and uh, wanted to just find out what happened. So he got back and said that uh, actually his final exams went fairly well. Um, one of his classes, it wasn't as good as the other, but he was he was pleased with his results overall. And that boosted his confidence going into the qualifying exams in January, where he passed. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, congrats, Zachary. Great job. Uh, and he said that after that point, people actually began to notice that some of the pressure was off and that, that he was a little bit more relaxed. And, and he went on to describe how a lot of his nervousness through that process was because he came from a small university and he felt like he hadn't been prepared for being at a top tier research institution. So that smacks to me of the kind of imposter syndrome. But what he said helped was finding other people who had come from those same smaller institutions, maybe that didn't have as much experience coming in and being able to talk through it with them gave him more confidence, let him see that it was possible to get through. And now he says, I'm looking forward to one day graduating and reflecting on what will be an incredible experience despite the bumps. And, and very generously, he offered that uh, if anyone would like to reach out and wants to talk to somebody who's been through it, he he has offered to be that reference. So get in touch with us if you'd like to get in touch with Zachary and we will connect those dots. Dan, I remember having suffering with the same issue and I started grad school at a big research university. And, and like Zachary, I came from a smaller liberal arts school and did research with mostly undergrads in the lab. And we were interacting directly with the PI every day. And it really was a shock to my system to suddenly be thrown into this research culture at a large institution with all these postdocs and grad students. And the PI was a little more distant. Yeah, you may not see that PI for weeks or months. Yeah. And you know, maybe it's a topic for a, a future show. But I remember I fell in love with research the way that it existed at my undergrad institution. And then it was totally different when I actually started my PhD. And that was part of the adjustment period was just getting used to that new type of environment. So I, I definitely yep. identify with Zachary there. All right, Dan, are you ready for me to lift the suspense on why we're drinking this wine? Please lift the suspense. You have not allowed me to hear about what we are going to discuss. Science in the news coming up. All right, Dan. So you care about your privacy, don't you? I do care about it, yeah. Except for during this podcast, yeah, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> you do have a podcast. This is really one of the more surprising things about you is the fact I don't think I ever would have predicted you and I would have a podcast together. Well, I find it deeply uncomfortable and I try to make sure no one listens. So <laughs> that's the way I handle that. Well, what about Dan? How, how do you feel about giving companies access to your genetic information? No, thank you, sir. And in fact, I have avoided all of the existing... Uh, ways that that happens, I think. You definitely have. And you know, Dan, we, we differ to a certain degree in the amount that we cling to our own privacy. I sort of just throw caution to the wind and put it all out there. Actually, you know this, Dan, I had a webcam all throughout college in my dorm room. 
which is super weird, but I guess some funny stories <laughs> it, came out of that. It is weird. I think I was like a reality TV star in training. This is everybody should keep in mind. This is back in the day when the webcam <laughs> made one picture every fifteen minutes or something. That's right. No, it was. It, it wasn't upload. a streaming live show. Yeah. yeah, I actually remember that during my junior year, I figured out how to have the page load a live image anytime it was refreshed. So instead of just uploading a new photo every five minutes, you really could, if you refreshed over and over, it would tell the webcam to take a photo. Part in hacker, real time. part wizard, Josh. Well, I got an email from the IT department that I was using too much bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, images were a big deal. Know, yeah, I back know, in which the is so Stone funny Age. now that we're all streaming, you know, HD quality video, but my one <laughs> just Periscope my one it, yeah. photograph every five seconds was too much. So, you know, there are a lot of companies that are out there these days that are collecting and utilizing genetic information to tell you certain things about yourself. And some of these are pretty well known. Sites like Ancestry.com, 23andMe, and other companies like that. Uh, what do you think about those companies, Dan? Um, I have mixed feelings about them, and I think the genie's out of the bottle, though. Oh, oh yeah. did you see that there was another person arrested for a cold case based on the genetic profiling Ancestry.com so, style? So this is a thing. Yeah, we, it we was just on CNN the, today, yeah. The Golden State Killer a few episodes back, and yep. it was a family member who had uploaded their they genetic data arrest, to one of these Ancestry sites. Arrested a man for murder in 1987. Well, if you are one of my family members and you have committed a crime, you better watch out because Look I have out. sent my DNA Look out. to Ancestry.com. Um, well, anyway, Dan, anyway, Dan, there are certainly some important advances using personalized genetic information, like the whole field of pharmacogenomics, for example. You know, this idea that we don't just do these one-size-fits-all treatments for disease, but you're physician would look at your own genetic information and say, you know, Dan, you're a good candidate for this drug because you have this gene, whereas that drug won't do anything for me because of my genetics. So that's useful. Yeah, I think that is a great application of that technology. I am not convinced that the commercial companies are aimed in that direction right now. I think there's there's a uh, maybe a tendency to provide additional testing to identify diseases that may or may not manifest, which can lead to more treatments, which can have side effects. So I'm, I'm on the, you know, we've talked about the statistics of testing. Mm, that's true. But right now I don't see that application uh, manifesting in hospitals and with physicians. And that's what, that's where I would want to see it happen. Well, here's an application that I think you can get behind, Dan. I want to introduce you to Venome. And that is vino plus genome equals venome. Vino meaning wine? Meaning wine. Uh, when I first saw it, I thought it was vinome, but I think it could yeah. be venome. So this is your DNA guide to the wines you'll love. Are you are you collecting my DNA from the rim <laughs> of my glass, Josh? Do I need to like wipe this before I leave? That's what I'm doing, Dan. So venome is a company. And the service they provide is, uh, this is quote from their website, taking the guesswork out of buying wine. And so what they do is they analyze your DNA and your taste preferences and then match you with hard-to-find wine selected for your unique palate. This is my, <laughs> you, not everybody can see me. This is my skeptical face, Josh. What does my DNA have to do with my wine preference? I'm glad you asked, Dan. So, okay, great. So let me tell you a little bit about their, their process. Keep shoveling, Josh. Go ahead. <laughs> Hopefully Venom doesn't want to be a sponsor because I'm about to ruin it. Uh, yeah, Dan, if you could just back off <laughs> Venom really quick. Can we re-record this part? Okay, so, so let me tell you how this works. So first, you can, you can take their wine quiz, all right, so they can learn a little bit of information about yourself. And I actually took this quiz, Dan. I'm going to pull it up for you right here. These are the types of questions they ask here. So, so how well do you like each of the following? And there's a happy face, a neutral face, and a frowny face. So, so smell of cut grass. Yeah, that smells all right. Taste of peaches. Oh, am I taking the test now? Yeah, we're not going to go through all of it. Okay. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Great, I like the taste of peaches. That seems great. Okay, how about blackberries? Yeah. Kind of neutral I'm on neutral that? neutral on okay. that, yeah. All right, what about sweetened coffee? Not what I would drink. No, me neither. Uh, how about exotic earthy mushrooms? Mm, probably not. Okay. Black coffee. Nope. Okay. And how about some savory umami flavors? Yes, of yeah, course. Great. 
All right. So, so anyway, there are other questions, and then they ask you... Pick uh, my favorite three cheeses. <laughs> your yeah. favorite three cheeses. Uh, there's Actually, let's just... What are your favorite three cheeses? I'm not... <laughs> you're... you're pub, you know, we just talked about how private I am in my life, and you're broadcasting my favorite three cheese choices. Uh, so we don't have to go through this. So they ask you if favorite... If somebody uh, wanted to come after me, Josh, they just poison my favorite three cheeses. <laughs> and then they ask you if you like to explore new wines or generally... We haven't uh, gotten to any genetics yet. Yeah. So, so anyway... I mean, you could tell what kind of wine I liked based on those questions, I'm sure. Right. So, so you take this quiz. I like grass wines. But here's the thing, Dan. All right. So I do, and I want to tell you, so my results from the quiz is they told me that based on my answers that I have similar wine preference to less than 1% of the population. <laughs> Which they probably say to everybody, right? Well, I don't no, know. No, no, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that seems to surprise me. But then they say this. However, your DNA can tell us much more about your biological taste preferences. So you can join Venome to receive a saliva collection kit, mm, and they no, will analyze my DNA to reveal my personal wine palette. And then, Dan, you know what they'll do next? Sell it to somebody else? <laughs> uh, well, they don't claim that, not yet. Discuss uh, it with your health insurer? They will send me hand-selected boutique bottles catered specifically to my Venome results. Delivered right to my doorstep. I just hope and pray, Josh, that you did this. <laughs> so I didn't do this. Oh. I, did not send in, I did not send Boo. in my DNA. Okay, but so this seems a little ridiculous, right? I mean, this me, is a real thing. To me, right? it seems ridiculous, but you, you, I, don't know, I can't tell if you uh, buy it or not. Do you believe in it? Well, you know, you, you kind of hit, hit upon my, my belief in this, is that this probably has 98% to do with how I answered the quiz, you know, do you like trying new wines? Do you like bitter flavors or sweet flavors? Uh, it's really what hard for your me? bank account number and your mother's maiden <laughs> name. Right. Uh, it seems really hard for me to think that by uh, paying them 80 bucks for a Helix DNA test, which is what they call it, yeah. would provide any other useful information. But Dan, I'm not done yet because Venom is actually part of a broader business model called the Helix Marketplace. Now I'm getting frightened. So the Helix Marketplace is a conglomerate of companies that collect your DNA and use this information to sell you personalized products tailored to your genetic traits, or so they say. So let me give you a few examples. I of, need some examples. Of some of other these. than wine, I can't think of anything. Okay. So there is Startline, which determines how your genes compare to elite athletes to determine what sports you might be good at. Zero sports. <laughs> I so can answer that already. You, you may have some... Some hidden golf genes that you didn't even know. You might I doubt be, it. I have golfed before. It's not true. Uh, then there's also slumber types. You can learn about your sleep type and what environment you are best adapted to sleep. Restfully. And I assume they're going to sell me sports equipment and mattresses. Yeah. Uh, course, yeah. Okay. Course, so that's yeah. where this is going. Yeah. Uh, and then this one, Dan. This one's really oh, odd. Yeah. Uh, baby glimpse. Okay. Okay. This one, I'm not. <laughs> I can't even talk about this. Uh, <laughs> so th these are not my words. Okay, Baby Glimpse is a bright and fun experience to celebrate the possibilities of your DNA. <laughs> and so the way <laughs> the way this works, okay, is presumably you and someone you potentially would be interested in procreating with go on can each send in your own DNA and they will send you um some information about what kind of kid you might have together. Basically what the baby looks like. I mean, it just seemed like such a weird premise. It's like, hmm, before I get with you. Well, I, I have to say something about baby glimpse. Yeah, will go ahead, will go they ahead. 3D print the baby and mail it to me? Mm. Or do I kind of like choose which one I want? <laughs> no. Uh, I don't think they're that they're doing that yet. 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 Okay. Um, and then the last sort of genre of these sites are personalized items like personalized socks there's dot one and personalized totes this what is are you talking about this is great this personalized totes is the company is called acg tote what are you talking about okay so what they do i'm growing more enraged by the moment okay so what they do with these is they actually look at one of your your regions of dna one of your snips you know where you would have a uh, very vari variation from other individuals and they color code the A's, G's, C's, and T's, and they will make you some socks or a tote bag with a unique color pattern tailored to your genetic sequence. Oh, this I see. Region. I yeah. see. This is not choosing the exact right pair of socks for me based on my genome. This is just printing nope. the... This is simply uh, printing the... Visualization of based my Based on... Yeah, you can see. Those look great. Some Those stripey. look great. Yeah. Yeah. For all the tote bags I don't need, uh, that would be the one I didn't get. 
I mean, so this is ridiculous, right? On one hand, I mean, on one hand, you can think, well, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of a neat little thing. You know, you print out like some socks that the stripe pattern is based on, you know, your genetic sequence. But then I thought, okay, well, the more of these you do, these are different companies that now have a database with my genetic information. And maybe I decided I'm trusting Ancestry.com for some reason, but it seems to me every different time you send that genetic sample out there, are they storing my saliva sample? What, what are they doing with that, I guess? Okay, Josh, my skepticism is now gone. I want, I want in on this. So here's the, here's the pitch. We're going to close down the podcast. We've got mm-hmm. a new business. It's genetic testing but for dating. You with me? Okay. So we will guarantee that you are not dating your sister. We do that test. We could do that. Right away. Yeah. Or even your cousin, probably. Yeah, that'd be amazing. That could be useful. Or a serial killer from the 1980s. (laughs) I think that'd be valuable. (laughs) That would be valuable. You know, I was going to say, Dan, is we could do a new company that will test genetically for what podcast you are most likely to enjoy. So all you have to do, send us your saliva sample and then fill out this detailed survey about your preferences and your daily commute. Perfect. And we will send you your results. Done. All right, Dan. So anyway, uh, I thought you would enjoy. I just came across this a couple of weeks ago and was, you know, I was familiar with Ancestry because I had done it. And by the way, Dan, Ancestry DNA the, the DNA um, arm of Ancestry.com now has over 7 million customers, including wow. me. That is amazing. I don't know whether I am more enraged or more sad. Probably both. Mixture of both. Well, that sounds like a good science in the news then. <laughs> Enjoy <laughs> your cover day. <laughs> Thank Cheers. <you. laughs> All right, Dan. We have another listener question this week. And so, so we got an email that we're going to talk about today, and he asked to remain anonymous, so we're going to come up with a, a pseudonym. Yeah, and the question is about leaving the state and finishing your PhD, so we'll, we'll call him Walker for now. Let me read the email. Greetings. I recently found your podcast, and I find it fascinating. I'm working my way backwards through this series, and after listening to episode 87, How to Choose a PhD Program, And given my experience in graduate school thus far, I realized that I probably should have taken more time to decide where to go. You remember episode 87, Josh? I remember it like it was seven episodes ago. You're so good at math. Eight. Eight. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, so he goes on. I'm currently in my third year of a PhD program in computer science and engineering. Four years ago, I got a packet inviting me to apply to a fairly prestigious university in the Midwest for graduate school. I had planned on applying to graduate school anyway, after gaining a little experience in industry, so I decided to go ahead and put it in my application. Well, fast forward a few months, and I had a job in Oregon that I wasn't enjoying, and found out I got into said university. I pushed off admission until the following spring, and when the time came, my wife and I fled from where we were living, hoping that moving to the Midwest would be a great fresh start. We were wrong. Ooh. Yeah, this is where it turns a corner. My wife and I are both quite unhappy here. The weather is awful 11 months of the year. Neither of us really feel safe here. And my wife can't find any jobs where she can apply her degree. I'm done with courses. My research is going all right. And I'm hoping to propose my thesis before the end of this year. At this point, I've fulfilled my residence requirement. So I could possibly, with the blessing of my advisor, complete my thesis as a non-resident, meaning my wife and I could live wherever we want. I was hoping that you guys might be able to shed some light on the pros and cons of going non-res. I have created my own list, but I would love to hear from others who have chosen to go non-res and how it went, as well as those who decided going non-res was not for them and why. Thank you, Walker. Great question. So to summarize, he moved somewhere for grad school, he and his wife, and they really didn't like living in that place or they don't like living in that place. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, when we talked in episode 87 about making sure you can live where grad school happens to be, that checkbox didn't get checked. Yeah, the so PhD, they're pretty unhappy. Yeah, the work is going okay, and the research is okay, but just the the life there is not good. So classes are done, and, and he's in computer science, so I reached back out and, and asked questions about what type of work he would need to be doing to finish his degree, and it's in computer science. Uh, it's stuff that he can take with him, and his advisor is really out uh, out of town a lot anyway, so he only sees his advisor periodically. So... I, Josh, this is this is a tricky one. Can you finish a PhD when you're not at the university where you are uh, doing the research? 
Well, I reached out to a few people on on Twitter last week to to just see if there were others who who had this experience. Yeah, how of, common is this? I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, Dan, you and I had a similar experience being in more molecular biology type fields. There would have been no way I could have done my PhD remotely because unfortunately, I relied on centrifuges and uh, gel boxes. You don't and, have a BSL three at home. <laughs> BSL three, which I did not have in my in the crawl space of my townhome, <laughs> but you could have. But I, I guess I could have. Um, and I will say, Dan, maybe this could be selection bias of the people who responded, but most everyone who responded, and there were several, had fairly positive things to say about their experience finishing their PhD remotely. And I will say, in in some of the cases, these were situations where a PI took a position at a different university. And so rather than moving their life along with the faculty member, they decided to stay and, and complete their PhD where they were versus moving on. So they weren't making the change their PI was, their lab was moving. That's right. So so a few of the things I heard, so Ursula on, on Twitter said um, that it was sort of good. Um, I stayed in the same place. The advisor moved. We already talked by phone a lot due to his travel schedule, so transition was easy. So that sounds similar to, yeah, to Walker. He wasn't used to having this really close day-to-day interaction with the PI. Um, Dr. K. Taylor said, um, yes, it went okay for the most part. The disadvantage was not being able to hunt the advisor down and getting answers or revisions in a timely manner, but time management was very key and maintaining motivation to get done while working remotely. And that makes a lot of sense. And then similar response from Sarah Patterson, who said this past year, she has been working remotely on her PhD and the experience affirmed that time management investment in the project can carry a lot of weight, even apart from direct supervision. Uh, I got a message from Professor Christelle Vincent, who said that for her, it was mostly pros which versus cons, which is why why she did it. Um, and she, mostly pros, not poetry. <laughs> that's I felt yeah. the need to clarify. Yeah, I was very confused. So, so this was another situation where the the PI and the lab was moving, and she would have had to move from a town she really enjoyed to a different place um, and get a car. She didn't have a car um, and figure out a new city just as she was really getting into her research. And she said the advantages were she got to be more independent from her advisor, which gave her a lot more freedom to choose her postdoctoral position because she wasn't afraid of not having this direct supervision. She didn't have any separation anxiety and knew that she had the confidence to work and make progress uh, more independently. And, And she kind of liked having that interaction with her advisor where she had to actually type up and organize her ideas versus just showing up in the office and having an informal conversation. I thought that was really an interesting insight. Um, And sometimes just the effort of typing up those questions would help her to answer the questions and progress more quickly. Um, And then she also said all of that information was already typed up for writing her thesis. Now, she did say the negatives were that it certainly was harder to get funded on her advisor's grant to go to conferences since she wasn't a student where the grant was held anymore. Uh, And it seems like that may not be the case for for Walker. Good to think about. Yeah, if you want to go to conferences, how does that work out with Mm -hmm. with, uh, payment for the travel and the hotel stay? Yeah, and and also she, she mentioned that she wasn't quite as much on her advisor's direct radar. So she didn't always hear all about the opportunities available as quickly as students who were directly working with them from day to day. However, she continued to stay in touch with them as well, and they would often keep her in the loop. So I think that could be some good advice too, is if you're part of a research group. I um, mean, again, I don't know if the nature of, of Walker's PhD is it's really him and the PI, and that's kind of it. But if they are part of a broader research group, not just keeping in touch with the PI, but maintaining connection with the with the other uh, researchers in the group as well. So, so this was some of the feedback I got. I thought some good advice there, uh, but a lot of positive thoughts. That's good, yeah. And I think it's a launching off point for a couple of other things that you know we think you should consider, Walker. For me, Josh, the most important thing is to guarantee or to ensure as closely as possible that Walker is going to be able to finish his degree uh, remotely and that he's not going to get the runaround when it comes time to actually you know, finish his dissertation and graduate. So my first question is, how clear are your goals? And have you gotten your committee together and your your advisor to agree on those goals? So that when you come to the end of, of your research, what I don't want to see is, well, you could also do these 15 other things or, you know, 
you get halfway through uh, a, a track and find out that wasn't actually what you should be working on this whole time. That's my fe- that's my first fear for uh, being remote. Those are the type of things that get worked out in weekly lab meetings or in uh, FaceTime with a PI, but you're going to be going for stretches between having those interactions. And so uh, getting that as clear as possible, I think is really important. Yeah. And you know, honestly, Dan, some of those issues can arise even if you're not working remotely on your so PhD. So true. You know, it is very easy to get caught up in the days, becoming weeks, becoming months, Um, between scheduling committee meetings and setting these tangible deadlines of progress that are going to help you get done. And that can happen even if you're not working remotely. But I think you're right, Dan. I think that could be even more possible if if you're remotely uh, because because you're not seeing the person day in and day out. So there are going to be fewer informal opportunities for you to bump into a member of your committee and they ask you, hey, you know, we haven't met for a while. So I think this is good advice for all grad students, but especially for, for you, Walker, and other people working remotely, is really making sure you are taking control of your own progress and taking control of your own exit plan, if you will. Uh, and make sure you are staying on top of scheduling those committee meetings, setting deadlines and appointments with your PI, even though they aren't with you in the same place. But but get things on the calendar. Let's touch base every Friday. And, um, you know, let's make sure I'm scheduling these committee meetings every six months. It's going to be even more crucial. Yeah, that's so, so important. Uh, hopefully, Walker has been around his advisor long enough to understand that person a little bit. So I've, I have another concern is that the advisor or the committee might change their mind in the intervening time. So you know your advisor. if Or, or you, maybe you know other graduate students who have been through that lab or that program. If there is a likelihood of kind of shifting uh, projects or horses in midstream, that's something you're going to want to be very aware of. And I think that's going to be harder if you're remote um, than it would be if you were there. Um, not to say that it's not hard all the time, but it's something to know going in. It, if, you're, if your advisor is uh, very straightforward, very clear about what they expect, then it's less of a concern for me. Um, but I, I think your, your primary goal is to understand how long it's going to take to finish. So I don't know what a, a computer science PhD requires, how much time it takes, but I can tell you human nature is you're going to want to get done as quickly as possible because the longer it takes, I think the harder it is to finish. The more years go by, the less you'll feel focused, the less you'll feel motivated. And so if you don't have a very uh, concrete timeline for how to get done, I think that's going to hurt in the long run. Yeah, I agree, Dan. And I think some of that is is certainly having, like you said, these crystal clear conversations with your PI and your committee. I'm just really making sure they are on board and that you feel confident they are going to support you just as strongly remotely as they would if you were there face to face, but also knowing yourself too. grad school is temporary and you do want to get done as quickly as possible. So, you know, making sure that if you do transition away from the place where you are now, that your, your PhD isn't going to end up dragging on for years longer, because then, you know, you've actually almost shot yourself in the foot because maybe you could have stayed there and it sucks to live there, but you know, you could have, really get, churned get it and out. Get out. Yeah. That would have been even a motivating factor to get your work done as quickly as possible, drive things to finish. So then um, you graduate and you can move on and don't look back. Um, so just making sure that, you know, remotely that you um, have some things in place and you feel internally motivated um, enough that you can, can get things done in a timely manner. And I will say though, sometimes, and this is why it's so important to consider where you'll be happy living nothing can demotivate you as much sometimes as if your life outside of your research really stinks and you're not so happy. true. Yeah. It um, sounds like there's a lot to gain uh, for leaving that, that place where the university is. It is demoralizing. It's um, not safe. There's, you know, his wife or, is not working. So it sounds like there could be a lot of benefit to getting out and maybe those, those things will improve motivation. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said from all the people who responded and said it was a really good situation for them. And you could use this as a growth opportunity for you to continue to gain your own independence and and build your own time management skills and and ways to stay intrinsically motivated, which are useful skills for whatever you end up doing next. Yeah, so let's run through the laundry list of, of some other things that are probably on your list, Walker, of things that will be harder to get access to if you're remote. I don't think that any of these are deal breakers and, and they may be 
totally uh, not interesting to a computer science major, but library access, I don't know how important that is, or access to online journals. Um, you'll have to find a way to get access to those. Peer support, you know, Josh, I, I think I can't overstate how important that was for, at least for me, hopefully for you, but um, being around other students going through the same thing, it's, it's so central to what got me through. Um, and that's going to be harder if you're somewhere else. Being able to quickly, I think we've mentioned this, quickly check in with your advisor, uh, maybe turn a corner rapidly rather than waiting a few weeks. Uh, I don't know if you'll need materials or reagents. As Josh mentioned, that's tough if you're in a biomedical research lab, maybe not so tough if you're writing code. Access to core facilities. So anybody who's listening who does biological research, those are, those are generally pretty local. Seminars. I don't know what seminars look like in a computer science major, but it's, a, it's an important way to network and an important way to learn about what's going on in the field. So when you go to get a postdoc, it's much easier to do if you've already met the, the researcher when they came and gave a talk at your university. Yeah, you know, that's true, Dan, because in some ways, Walker's situation is, is the opposite of a lot of the folks who responded to, you know, to our request of, of people who had the experience of working remotely from their PI is a lot of these people, their PI left, and the reason they wanted to stay is they had a lot of these things set up already um, in the place where they were. They had the, the peer support, the core facilities, the, they knew the environment, and they didn't want to leave, whereas Walker's situation would be, um, he's the one who's leaving. Yeah, they weren't also simultaneously looking for housing and for you know where to get groceries and all the things that come with moving to a new place. So you know they were maybe a, a, more of an advantage in that way all of that being said, Josh, I think it's still the right choice for Walker to to move, to move on. And I think that's largely for me based on the fact that he's doing computer science and not doing biomedical research. Do you have a different impression? Yeah. I mean, when I first read his email, I thought, well, it sounds pretty obvious. Yeah. yeah. Time to go. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're not enjoying your life there. Yeah. And, and you have this opportunity that's pretty great, the fact that you actually with the type of work you do, you can complete it. You don't have to make a decision between, um, and a lot of, a lot of grad students, we would have to make this decision, Dan, if we just really hated living in Chapel Hill when we were grad students, the decision would be, all right, we're either going to tough it out living here and finish our PhD or moving would literally represent having to leave the program yep, and do something right. else. So I think you have a great, the fact you have this flexibility is really great. Um, and Dan, you talked about some of the institutional things you might think about to make sure you have in place, but you know, we can also talk briefly about some of the internal, some of the internal questions and reflection you might want to do too. I, I think the reality is some people work, do better working remotely than others. That is, that is so true. Yeah. So once you've decided you are not going to, uh, stay in the, the current paradigm. And I think this, this applies to people who maybe are finishing just their dissertation offsite. So you've gotten to the end of your research period and you're just writing. I think all of this applies to you. I've worked, I work in a software company, so I've worked with um, people across the country and, and really around the globe who are working on our software but they just don't happen to be in our office. And so I've seen people succeed at it who, who are just great at it. They seem to thrive in that environment. And I've seen people who lose focus and lose track of what the project is all about and lose motivation. So it does come down a little bit to personality, but I think there are some things that Walker can do to stay on track. So question, how are you going to stay motivated? If you're going to work at home, which some people do and they do to great success, do you need a dedicated space? Like some people need to go to an office in their house. They can't be on the couch because if they do, they're going to see the laundry. And if they see the laundry, they're going to go do the laundry. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's me. I have never, I never want to do the laundry more than when I'm working from home. And I think, oh, you know, I really, oh, I should throw this laundry in or, oh, I really need to just clean that one thing up. Um, I can't do it. I have to, I have to actually go to a coffee shop or go to the library and, and get out of the house. That's not something I do well. And that's your jam, isn't it, Josh, going to the coffee I shop? Love the co I've done so much work at the coffee shop because for me, even for something like the library, it's just too quiet. Um, yeah. I actually like the energy of being out in public somewhere that, you know, there are things happening around me. It's not distracting per se. People aren't interrupting me, but that energy um, helps me to, to stay focused for some reason. Yeah. And, and stay awake. <laughs> no, that makes total sense. And I've worked with um, software developers who go work at co-working spaces. They're 
uh, rentable office spaces with other people renting office space. And it's, it's that same vibe, but you might have a dedicated desk and there'll be a coffee machine and other people around who are doing the same thing. And so you get the, the feeling of a company or a lab. Uh, they just have to all be working on kind of different things, but you'll make friends there. And it's a, it's something to look, look for as a co-working space. That's a good idea. And then as we know, Josh, you, you better have a daily schedule. You better have habits. And, uh, you know, people talk about get up and get dressed and eat breakfast and go to your work spot and start working because the temptation is always going to be to do the laundry or to clean the grime out from under the sink or whatever it is. Procrastination is a real thing. It hurts. It hurts. And, and with a PhD, you can kind of go on not being productive for a long period of time because no one is, is looking at your weekly work habits. Yeah. And I'll say, Dan, one thing that I did as a graduate student that was really helpful uh, because you're right, a lot of times there aren't these set deadlines as a graduate student that you ha- that anyone's forcing you to meet. It's kind of up to you. So, for example, if I was if I knew that I needed to start writing up my results for a paper, I would actually tell my advisor, "I'm going to give you a draft by next Friday." Of course, then usually I'd walk out of his office kicking myself because like, oh, "Why did I do that?" But instituting that hard deadline on myself was a type of motivation that I needed to make sure that I actually got this thing done that, that was beneficial to me to get done to make sure I actually did get it done in a timely manner. No, that's great. You, you're setting your own goals and, and making sure somebody holds you to them. And that's, that's the next step is how are you going to stay on track? Do you need some kind of weekly milestone? Do you need to have your advisor, like you said, Josh, expect something from you so that you deliver it? Do you want to put together some kind of task tracking system? So in software, uh, you can use something, uh, programs like Trello or Asana or even a spreadsheet or even hang post-it notes in your wall that break down the tasks you need to complete. And you physically move them um, kind of from left to right as you make progress on that project. That's the type of thing that will help you see how much you have left to do and then how much progress you've made. I love that for really anybody. Maybe those can be figures in your next paper. But it's the type of thing that, that makes visual something that is very unruly and very hard to understand, which is project management. I started using this to-do list app a few weeks ago, and it insults you if you if you don't check anything off the list for a while. Uh, it changes colors, it turns red, and it and it tells you how worthless you are. That is so awesome. <laughs> can I write some uh, some of the quips for it? <laughs> you, yeah. It almost feels like you, it's you talking, Dan. Yeah, really. I can hit yeah. closer to home than that app ever will, Josh, unless <laughs> you give it your DNA, in which case <laughs> That's true. it could do very well. It will discover why I'm procrastinating exactly. based on my genes and my answers to this extensive survey. You're bad at sports. Finish a task. <laughs> Did you want to talk about time management? Yeah, I just wanted to to call attention to a couple of episodes we've done that are, that are popular and I think um, helpful to people. So we did episode 15, which was simple tricks for time management, the Pomodoro technique. Josh, this is something you use. I still do, actually. Where you set a timer and you work through that timer, take a little break, set the timer again, work through the timer. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you even schedule in breaks and, and set a timer for those. More detail on that in episode 15. Yeah. And then episode 59, the focus funnel, where basically you try and figure out all the tasks you don't need to do ever again in order to get to the tasks that are really valuable. Those are things that I would uh, take a listen to in managing your, your time on your own. Yeah, no, these are all good. And I think, you know, Dan, one of the one of the last things, and I feel like a lot of this advice we're giving to to Walker about working remotely is really good advice, even if you're not working remotely. Walker has to be more intentional yeah, about it. Yeah, absolutely. It, and that's maintaining really good communication with your advisor and anyone else um, on your research team that, that you're working with. And it sounds like it's already an issue, right? It's It sounds like his advisor is away a lot. They communicate only periodically. But... You should understand going in, how frequently will you communicate? Are you going to do what Josh said, where you're going to share a weekly goal and then and then follow up on it? So figure out how often, what you intend to talk about. And then I would consider, and this is something we do with our remote developers, how often are you going to get together face-to-face? So we will fly in developers from wherever they happen to be for about a week at a time. And we do this maybe quarterly so that you have the chance to go eat lunch together and you have the chance to sit in a conference room and look at a whiteboard together. Those are that FaceTime is is really valuable. I don't know if you'll so you found it. that useful. Yeah, I do. And and it's it, a lot of it is for the the interpersonal bonding, but it's also a time when you can uh, kind of rethink about priorities and set the schedule for the next 4 or 5 or 8 weeks. Um so I think it's it's worth thinking about if you're going to go 
back to Oregon, how often will you need to get to the Midwest? How much is it going to cost? Maybe you don't need to go at all, but it's, it's worth considering. Yeah, this is all good advice. Dan, do you have any, anything else to add? Last thing is, is how you're going to collaborate. Um, you know, you, you're going to be writing and editing and writing code, and you're going to be working away from uh, your main hub. So obviously emailing files is all right, but it's annoying you have to wait for collaborators. If you're going to write your dissertation, you don't want to make a lot of changes in your, your Word document while somebody else is editing it because it's, it's, you're going to overlap. So consider using online tools. Um, Josh and I, for our podcast, we're not always in the same place. So we use Dropbox, we use Google Docs. Um, if you're coding, of course, you can use Git and things like that. But I would have a plan and a strategy for collaborating. If you need to talk to people, face matters, I think. So Skype or FaceTime or Google Hangouts. Figure out a way that you and your advisor, you and your lab mates, you and your team can get together regularly and in a way that's not painful because you won't do it if it's painful. We're so fortunate to live in such an age where we have all this technology where, you know, I realized like I really hate talking on the phone, but I really enjoy talking with people over, over Skype or FaceTime. It's a totally different experience. Because so, you, you can just be wearing a shirt, right? That's right. I usually do. Uh, but then I walk out of my office and all of my colleagues find yeah, that really that strange. not okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right, Dan. And, and Walker, I hope this was useful. And, and anyone else who is either in the process of working remotely to finish their PhD or thinking about it. Um, but if you do, let us know. And Walker, for sure, as time goes by, uh, reach back out to us and let us know how it is going for you. We'd love a follow-up. Love to know where you land and, and how it turned out. So send us your advice. Uh, any listeners who have been through this process, you can email it to podcast at hellophd.com or reach out to us on Twitter at hellophd. We'd love to have more advice. We can pass it on to Walker as we receive it. All right, Dan, do you have a word puzzle for us this week? I sure do. The clue last time was ancient Greeks speculated about a particle so small it was uncuttable. All right, I think I know this and I think I even know the origin. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess the word is Adam. That is absolutely correct. And I'm going to guess that the word origin has to do with the prefix A, which means can't or unable, and tome, like a tome, like a microtome, like you do cutting. Oh, yeah. Is that right? That is fascinating. And I, I haven't looked up microtome, but I think you must be right. It comes from uh, Greek atomos which is uncut or unhewn or indivisible. And you got it, A for not, and tomos for a cutting. So uh, uncuttables. They, they speculated that they're, if you take apart uh, a rock into a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller piece, eventually you'll get to a piece you can't break, and that's the atom. Uh, it turns out atoms, as they were named, can be broken, but that's a story <laughs> for a different day. Leave it alone, Josh. Uh, our winner was Daniel from the University of Colorado. So congratulations to Daniel. I'll be sending you an Daniel. Amazon gift card. Unfortunately, the etymology puzzle is going to take a little summer break while I recoup my uh, puzzle writing skills, and we'll be back shortly with that. Sounds great, Dan. Thanks, as always, for, for coming over to record another episode of Hello PhD. And thanks to you for listening. If you have a question or a topic idea, we'd love to hear it. You can email us at podcast at hellophd.com. Send us a tweet at Hello PhD, or you can leave us a message on our Facebook page. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes. We certainly love the feedback. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, and click on the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would appreciate the beer money or even the wine money. And thanks certainly to the ongoing support from all of our patrons. Thanks so much. And Josh, we will see you next time. See you next time.